In my book, Land of Promise, I argue that the situation was actually similar on the verge of the Great Depression of the 1930s. Only at that point, the United States was playing the role that China is playing now and perhaps in the near future. Already by 1900, the United States had emerged as the world's largest industrial country and the world's largest industrial exporter. <clears throat> Where things went horribly wrong came with World War I uh, because the United States then became the world's largest creditor. It was making loans to the British and the French uh, to fight the war and, and also to the Russians against uh, the Germans and, and the Central Powers. Uh, in the 1920s, the U.S. was like uh, China in recent years. It was the world's largest industrial exporter, was also the world's largest lender. It had all of this capital that it was trying to recycle. Well, that's, there's an essential uh, tension in, that, in those two roles because what you're saying is in that situation, uh, we're going to sell you our products and run a perpetual trade surplus with you. You cannot pay for our products by selling us your products. In those days, the United States had a high tariff to keep out foreign goods. Uh, and, to, and in recent years, China has used currency manipulation uh, to have the equivalent of a tariff uh, that is underpricing its goods instead of taxing imports has exactly the same results, protecting the Chinese market uh, from American uh, imports. Uh, so uh, just like China today, the United States in the 1920s was uh, just racking up capital from its uh, trade surpluses that capital could not be recycled in terms of purchases of British or French or uh, German goods. Uh, the Germans had to repay war debts uh, to the French and the, and the British, uh, war reparations. They could not pay for those uh, reparations by selling goods to the United States. The German goods were kept out by American protectionism, by the tariff. So consequently, you had this ever more elaborate Ponzi scheme of finance where the Germans borrowed the surpluses from the United States, recycled them in the form of uh, reparations payments to the British and the French, who also could not export to the United States. Uh, if you switch the two sides so that the United States of the 1920s is the China of the 2000s and the Europe of the 1920s is the United States of the 2000s, uh, uh, the debtor that is importing capital and running perpetual trade surpluses, uh, then you, you, you get the same picture of, of a system which it's just, it's building up, it's building up, it's building up, but the imbalance at some point is going to crack. Uh, and the crack comes when uh, uh, the mechanism for recycling the surpluses from the trade export countries, uh, which is namely debt. Uh, 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 can no longer be uh, paid down because uh, consumers haven't been paid high enough wages uh, or because it's uh, too much of it is speculative and nobody knows what assets are really worth. Uh, the way we got out of this situation was to have a more balanced economy with the Bretton Woods system uh, and a system of, of managed currency and somewhat managed trade from the 1950s to the 1970s. Unfortunately, to get from the 20s to the 50s, we had to go through the Great Depression and all of that turmoil and the rise of fascism uh, in World War II uh, and the destruction of the early Cold War. Uh, so while it's possible to chart a soft landing from these global imbalances uh, in which the, the countries that have been focusing on exports like China, Japan, and Germany would shift towards a more sustainable domestic consumption-driven level of growth, at the same time the United States would build up its battered export capacity, not too much, but, but, but a, a, a little bit. Uh, you can chart a soft landing, but uh, history shows that it's not enough to uh, point the direction you have to go. Uh, you have to overcome the resistance of the uh, vested interests in order to get there.